Welcome everybody to the first ever Google Hangout here in the House of Lords in support of Lord Sarch's Medical Innovation Bill. My name is Max Pemberton and I'm your chair for today. So you and your followers have a genuine opportunity to change the course of medical history, to help patients and doctors innovate and find new cures and treatments. The Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has promised that if you tell him you want the Medical Innovation Bill by responding positively to the Department of Health consultation, then he will pass this bill into law. So it's incredibly exciting. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves and then to speak for five minutes or so about why they support the bill. Um, I suppose we should start on my left with uh, Lord Saatchi. You would be forgiven for looking at me and saying, well, here is a man so distracted by grief that he thinks he can cure cancer by an act of parliament. So I think I should say right away, this bill is not going to cure cancer, but it will encourage the man or woman who will. And that's the reason why David's colleagues at the department, the Secretary of State himself and the Prime Minister have supported the bill and taken it forward as a, as a government bill. The Prime Minister himself says that his vision for the NHS is, as he puts it, every clinician a researcher, and as he puts it, every willing patient a research patient. Unfortunately, that's unlikely to come true under the present law. And I will explain, if I, man, if I may, why that's the case. I'll have to go into the current law for a few minutes to, to make this clear, and I think it's very clear to all of you now, but I'm going to spell it out again for, for what it's worth. The, the basic premise of this bill is that all cancer deaths are wasted lives. I don't mean that in the sentimental sense that if only my mother, sister, brother or daughter had gone on to fulfill their... I don't mean that at all. I mean it in the strictly mathematical sense that science does not advance by one centimetre as a result of all these deaths. Why is that? It's because the deceased receive only the standard procedure, the endless repetition of a failed experiment. Why is that? Because under current law, any deviation by a doctor from standard procedure, if anything goes wrong, is likely to lead to a verdict of guilt for medical negligence. Why is that? Because current law defines medical negligence as deviation from standard procedure. But as innovation is deviation, so non-deviation is non-innovation. Under the current law, just to be clear, the doctor is obliged to stick to the well-worn path, even though he or she knows it leads only to poor life quality followed by death. This is how current law inhibits medical progress. The preeminence of standard procedure is a flat contradiction of the logic of scientific discovery and the whole majestic scientific process comes to what we might call a dead halt at the bedside of the cancer victim. That's why the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State have supported this bill and are taking it forward. That's why so many doctors and professors, many of whom are around me here today, but who have worked on the drafting of this bill over the last year, put to me they put this case very bluntly. I'm quoting here the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford, who says, there will be no cure for cancer until real doctors with real patients in real hospitals can attempt some kind of innovation. And the Dean of Medical Sciences at Oxford, who is one of the key uh, mentors of this bill, who says, um, an inspiring phrase, that... Um, one patient can change the world. So what is the, what is the solution that this bill will take forward? Um, it, it's, the bill says this, we want there to be more freedom for doctors to innovate. On the other hand, we don't want doctors to be able to do whatever they want. We don't want patients to be treated like mice. 
We don't want reckless experimentation which puts patients' lives at risk, but we do want bold, scientific, responsible innovation. This bill achieves both ends. It clarifies and codifies for doctors, the courts, insurers, what is best practice in innovation. It removes the uncertainty and the ambiguity which now surrounds um, a trial after a, an uh, unfortunate event. And it provides what one of the um, leading justices in the land describes as, I'm quoting him, a clear path to lawful innovation. In summary, the good doctor will be encouraged by this bill. The bad doctor will be more easily exposed. That, I hope you agree, I know you agree, is a fine achievement for an eight-page Act of Parliament. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lothnarchi. Um, if I can move to my right, um, uh, Debbie Binner. Now, you've got a very personal um, story about why you support this bill. Yes, yeah. And first of all, I want to take you on a journey. Today, out there somewhere, a teenage girl is about to hear the worst of news. Whilst her friends fret about which hot boy fancies them or how popular they are on social media, this poor girl will be told that she has cancer. And her world, and that of her family and friends, will fall apart. I want you to imagine the unimaginable. Ask yourself, what if she was mine? Seven people between the ages of 13 and 24 are diagnosed with cancer each day in the UK. Leukaemia is the most common cancer, followed by those of the central nervous system. The cancers in this group that teenagers get are very different from children and very different from adults, and they are most nearly always the most aggressive. A bone cancer diagnosis when you're only 15 isn't the best of news. If you're lucky, you'll avoid amputation of one of your limbs. But not everybody is lucky. Even if this happens, the brutal reality is that your chances of survival are pitifully low and haven't shifted in about 30 or 40 years. You may naively expect your doctors to roll up their sleeves and assure you that they will throw everything at this. The stakes are so high, this is your child. You'll expect no stone to be left unturned in trying to find you a cure. You'll think any pro new promising treatments will be made available. If not here, then of course in the US. But this won't happen. Your doctors will probably avoid your eye contact and sometimes even avoid you together altogether. Your doctors will talk about processes and protocols. They won't tell you about a promising new treatment that was pulled years ago by a pharmaceutical company because kids, young people's cancers just aren't commercially viable. Look deeper and you'll find that the treatments they're proposing for you are over 40 years old and the protocols over 15 years old. Few new treatments are available, and if there are any, you are going to have to be extraordinarily lucky or have enough energy and the right high-level contacts help to get on them. God help you if you are running short on either of these. The few clinical trials that bother to include the rarer type of cancers that young people and children <coughs> get will, almost without exception, have bizarre entry criteria that make no clinical sense whatsoever such as a trial for a cancer that predominantly affects people aged 15 with a lower entry criteria of 18. You just couldn't make it up, really. You may well look into your doctor's eyes and shout and scream and complain and beg. He may well be sympathetic. He may well be very kind and really care about your child, but he may well do absolutely nothing and rest wearily back on those tried and tested, extremely conservative system that has some pretty strong evidence to support the fact that it is very unlikely to work. That child was, is mine. Excuse me a minute. Her name was Chloe and she died a year ago this Friday. When she was 18 years old and one month, she was popular, self-assured, charming, and very, very beautiful, both inside and out. She was blessed in that she was loved so much, and her death has left the deepest hole in our lives. A few of those people are here today, along there. <laughs> Sometimes I dare to imagine the unimaginable, 
What if six months before Chloe died, in August 2012, when all hope was almost gone, she had been entered into a special category that doesn't exist, yet desperately needs to exist? A special category where all bets were off. Once Chloe had only got six months left to live, how could any radical potential new treatment, I prefer actually innovative rather than radical, have been defined as too risky or too dangerous? These words, risky, dangerous, are utterly meaningless in this context. What if doctors tried something different, something new, something promising? Chloe may well have died anyway, and I accept that. But surely, what she would have left behind would have been more clinically valuable to other children, to other teenagers, our most special commodity. And for us, maybe, we could have kept faith a little longer. Of course, we didn't want her to suffer anymore, although it's important to remember that dying of cancer isn't a walk in the park either. And there is always a risk of making things worse. I know that. We desperately wanted hope. Chloe desperately wanted to live. She didn't want the medical establishment to give up on her, and neither did we. She didn't get those drugs, so the only medical advance resulting from Chloe's death was reproving for the zillionth time that an old protocol with old drugs doesn't work. No real useful contribution to medical science there, then. There's a huge problem treating rarer cancers and rarer illnesses generally. The fact they are rare means that there isn't enough data and there aren't enough people to test new treatments. We wanted to be one of those people, to help other people. If we won't save our child, we wanted to help other people. Even if Chloe had died anyway, whilst on some new, untested and risky treatment, her death would then have helped advance the science in that new arena. Her death might have given a greater survival chance to that child who is being diagnosed today. We desperately need this new special category so that doctors can try radical things when they know the existing drugs won't work. We need to support this medical innovation bill. It's simply the right thing to do. I cannot have my dearest wish to have my daughter back with us. So I'll go for my second wish, to use my family's story to ensure that the next Chloe who comes along, and so very sadly there will be more Chloes, will have a better chance of life. Thank you very much for listening. Debbie, thank you so much. Um, and next I'd like to hear from uh, Mike Thomas. I gripped the lectern tightly with both hands to try and pre prevent myself from breaking down with emotion. It was nearly a year ago. That lectern was at the front of St. Mark's Church in Purley, and I was starting to speak at the memorial service for my best friend. In front of me were hundreds of faces, young and old alike, people whom I'd known for years and people whom I'd never met before. But they were all there for the same reason. They were there to celebrate and remember an ultimately short but extremely well-lived life, the life of Chloe Drury. On Wednesday the 27th of February last year, I received a call. My friend sat me down, she looked me in the eye and told me that Chloe was going to die and there was nothing anyone could do anymore. It was going to happen in the next few days. I wasn't prepared to hear that, that Chloe was still alive but her fate was already decided. I sat in shock. I tried to ask questions about when it would happen, how did they know, but I wasn't really listening to the answers. Inside my head, I was trying to make sense of what I'd just been told. All I remember thinking is that I felt helpless, desperately helpless. That night, I stayed surrounded by friends. Trying to, trying to find comfort in each other, anything not to be alone. All, all night I rel relived the time I spent with Chloe, the first time we met, the day spent in her company, the last time I ever saw her. I thought about her dreams and her aspirations, the things she'd been so excited to do, and now they would never be fulfilled. When the news finally came through early the next morning that Chloe had passed, there were no more tears, no more uncontrollable emo emotion, just silence. I was completely numb. Over the next few hours I had conversations that I wish never had to happen. To be the bearer of the worst news possible. To look people in the eye, friends and family alike, and tell them that Chloe had died. I had to watch them break down in front of me. It was unbearable. You forget how many people are affected by one person, especially someone as caring, outgoing and joyful as Chloe was. There were two undeniable factors that helped me deal with Chloe's passing. Firstly, the unwavering and resolute support that we see, received from all our friends. Dealing with this alone would have been undoubtedly impossible. Secondly, the sheer bravery and optimism of Debbie. 
Despite what she has had to endure, she is always looking for a positive. Debbie has turned losing Chloe into her driving force, and this is where her outlook has led, to the launch of a new foundation aimed at helping those who find themselves in Chloe's situation. It was Debbie that urged me to speak at St Mark's Church, who gave me the opportunity to say goodbye properly. And when I stood at that lectern and I spoke, I felt I'd finally let Chloe know how much she had meant to me. And again, it was Debbie who asked me to speak today, allowing me to become, become involved in Create for Chloe, making Chloe the driving force in my life too. I hope her story becomes a catalyst for change, for innovation, and hope today I have given you an insight into the pain that losing a friend causes for young people like me. And if you remember just one aspect of my speech today, I urge for it to be this one. Chloe's death has brought about many questions into the red tape and bureaucracy regarding cancer treatments. But going forward, ask yourself this question. Have you done everything you could have? Were you bold enough, brave enough to demand more, more innovation, more accessibility to cancer treatments so that more lives are saved where possible? For Chloe and the hundreds of others who find themselves in her situation, make sure the answer is yes. Thank you. Um, and next we have Charlie Chan from the uh, Royal College of Surgeons. I think he's joining us via a Google Hangout. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm sorry that I cannot be there with you in person. This whole bill resonates strongly with me. We treat cancer patients every day in routine hospitals and every day normal people will face these difficult decisions along with their doctors. I think that we have got into a system where it is extremely difficult for doctors to innovate. Doctors are sometimes quite good and particularly surgeons, who might creep at the edges. But to make big changes is actually very difficult. I think that we are stuck in an era where, where the adherence to randomized trials and all it entails provides a straitjacket for ordinary doctors in the community. I know that anecdotal evidence may inform and may not persuade, but I think that having anecdote from innovation will provide the hypothesis for new discoveries and new treatments. I have one of those pet hates of dogma. I think we have seen over the generations doctors and other people practicing in set ways and perhaps not being able to step back and look at things in a different way. I'm not saying that we should practice in an irresponsible way. And I think this bill provides a really measured, responsible framework for people up and down the country to try and make a difference for everyday people. I wish it, this bill all the best and I look forward to hearing your questions later. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think then we can um, open up um, to some of the questions from the, from the audience. Um, um, I understand, this. is there Professor Dean Fennell? Yes. If I can ask you, um, I suppose I'm interested in the idea that um, we already have um, clinical trials that are in, are in place. Um, 
what, what's the difference, though, between the, the, what, what's the difference that this bill would add as opposed to the, the normal processes that we already have within cancer treatment and indeed within medicine? Well, take Mr. Learman's example because the majority, the vast majority of trials that have been developed for this disease have been developed around the standard of care. So the idea is if you have a new drug, perhaps you can add it to existing standard of care, but it still leaves a vacuum after that standard of care has been completed. And so when patients, as they will, relapse, they have no options at all. Okay, there are no standards that, that can be exercised. Um, I think the other problem with clinical trials, potentially the randomised, the large um, studies, that paradigm that we, we all um, work with in, in terms of defining efficacy, requires randomization. So patients very often will be randomised to receive a new drug or not receive a new drug. What happens to those individuals at progression? Sometimes we can do what is called a crossover, but if we're doing a large trial, it's never going to have a hope of getting a, a drug to licence. Um, these things aren't allowed because it affects the endpoint, it affects the, the result of the trial. And so with the sort of innovations that we're seeing in the ability of drugs to target specific genetics very effectively, where the activities are actually remarkable in some instances, and we can see very exciting, very encouraging responses to some of these targeted drugs. Um, one of the questions that are being raised, and in fact, um, you know, in the US recently with a drug in lung cancer, a license was passed without the need for a randomized trial because the drug was so effective. And I think we're going to see more and more of these opportunities arising. And there are debates about the way in which we you know, try and pass effective therapy. Do we have to wait for the large international you know, randomized study that takes years? Or can we have a very, very strong efficacy signal in a small number of patients that gives us sufficient confidence this is an active drug with low toxicity and the patient should get it now? And if I could go to um, Mavis and I, um, thank you so much for coming. Now, are you, are you, are you, is it a, you're a patient of Professor no, Pennells? No, But you have no. the same condition that he specialises yes, in, is that right? Yes, yeah. Could, could you talk about... Yes. Um, so I'm Mavis and I. Um, I was diagnosed uh, with mesothelioma uh, and given three months to live for four and a half years ago. So I'm coming up to five years, which only 2% live to five years. Um, so I'm exhausting all their drugs and treatment <laughs> options. Um, I'm told by my oncologist there is no more treatment. I, I can have the same old, same old. I've had to spend m lots of money and time knocking on other hospital doors, searching for the country, <laughs> searching the country for treatment. As my mesothelioma is growing again, I feel so strong in mind, but not in body, that I can go on in treatment. So I'd like a phase one trial. Why not? Um, I sign, um, I'm terminally ill anyway, I sign a, a contract, a consent form, so why can't I have a phase one trial? Um, I should have, I should not have to tra chase treatment, it should be, all be in a central bank where my doctors can then look in and find it and say, you can have this. At the moment, I'm going up to London and say, come back and say, I can have this, it, that shouldn't be on. So... Uh, I back this innovation bill, and when do I want it? I want it today, because I might not be here tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, Mavis, can I, can I ask? So when you went to your doctors um, and you said to them, you know, look, all bets off, I'll, do, I'll, I'll have whatever treatment um, is around. What did they say to you? It can't work like that, because it's too, it's too much red tape. Lord well, Sarchi, this is something that uh, you know, I'm hearing again and again, this idea of the frustration of patients, because actually they, they're willing... To, to, to put themselves forward for these trials and then, you know, because of the bureaucracy, there's this kind of brick wall goes up. So it, how exactly will this, the, the bill help doctors negotiate the bureaucracy that's already there? Because surely one bill can't rewrite all the policies in all the hospitals. The reason, that, the reason this, this Act of Parliament is so important is that it alters the existing nature of the existing law, which I should just explain in answer to your question. I think if I quote the president of the family division of the High Court, Baroness Butler Sloss, one of the, one of the uh, most senior judges in the country who's given us uh, tremendous advice on the drafting of this bill. In an in a important test case, the current law is based on case law. It isn't in the statute as it would be if this bill became law. Um, in a case called Sims versus Sims, in the, in the High Court. Um, her final judgment said, I think I know it by heart, that 
if we if what if we waited for the Bolam test, which is the current um, test uh, of the legality of an innovation, if we she said if we wait for the Bolam test to be fulfilled to its complete extent, no innovative activity like heart transplant treatment or the discovery of penicillin would ever be attempted. So what the judges are saying is that there needs to be a better balance between defensive medicine, which rightly doesn't want to put the patient's life at risk, and also doesn't want to put the doctor's reputation at risk. A better balance between defensive medicine and innovation. Under the current law, that's impossible to achieve. The balance is too much too far towards the status quo. This, this bill shifts the balance towards innovation in what the judges tell us is a safe way. Um, I mean, we, we've been speaking about cancer, um, but I wanted um, to come to you, um, Alex, um, to talk about um, the fact that this bill actually has implications not just for cancer, but also for, for other conditions. Yeah. Um, so my name's Alex Smith, and I'm, I run a charity called Harrison's Fund, and I've been asked here to talk a little bit about, about uh, a condition that isn't cancer. When Harrison was just four years old, I took him to his paediatrician, thinking he might have a mild physical delay and may need physical therapy. Within two weeks, a blood test and a visit with a neurologist provided us with the most devastating diagnosis imaginable, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The neurologist explained to us that Harrison's muscles would rapidly deteriorate. He would lose the ability to walk, to use his arms, to bathe himself, to go to the bathroom on his own. Eventually, Duchenne would attack his heart and lungs, and the, the disease would take his life in his late teens or early 20s. We have nothing to stop it, he told us. It is 100% fatal. Harrison is now nearly eight, and we live each day with the knowledge that because he's got a duplication of exon 51 of his dystrophin gene, his symptoms continue to progress, and he continues on a steady and rapid physical de decline. Harrison's doing incredibly well considering that he has reached a plateau all children with Duchenne do around the seventh and eighth birthdays. This is a stage of progression that is marked by an accelerated decline. It is marked by shock, the shock of his legs buckling without warning, sending him tum tumbling to the ground. This is the time when kids are moving faster and pushing limits and growing and looking forward to the future. And I'm terrified that Harrison may not have one. Annual events like birthdays and the end of a school year are marked with conflicting emotions. They're marked by relief that we were given the gift of another year and by grieving one less year that we'll have together. While these symptoms are heartbreaking, I'm also filled with a sobering reality that this is mild compared to what we'll face in the very near future. There is a train racing towards my little boy and I'm running as fast as I can to scoop him up and save him. But I'm acutely aware that I may not make it in time. This medical innovation bill has the very real potential to help doctors and clinicians slow down that train. In our case, the risk of doing nothing is not nothing. The risk of doing nothing is fatal, fatal every single time. What we are not willing to do is assume the risk of doing nothing. If a potential therapy shows promise of stabilization or improvement over what would be expected without any treatment and it shows safety then patients and parents should be given a choice to try it. Because at the end of every discussion assessment and assessment of a therapy, we must never lose sight of the reality that the risk of having Duchenne far outweighs the risk of most potential treatments. And our children must be the beneficiaries of our best effort and of our most noble intentions and of our greatest commitment to safety and speed. Because at the end of the day, these children are not statistics. They are not a commodity, they are not someone's science experiment. They could be your boys or your grandchildren, and they may not be, but the responsibility for saving them belongs to all of us. I believe we are close to a treatment. We are so close that my son Harrison is part of a generation that will either be the last to die from Duchenne or be the first to survive it. We must have a great sense of urgency and we must always remember that the children should not serve the science, but the science must always serve the children. 
My biggest fear is that one day we will not have been successful in getting the therapies we need and my son will look up at me and say, Daddy, could you have done more? With this bill and the innovation it would encourage, we have the potential to move forward and reduce Duchenne from a 100% fatal condition to that of a chronic one. The time is now. We don't have time to waste. Make time. I was also wondering, is there Professor Hampton? Hi. Um, I wonder if you had any, any comments. Oh, yes, certainly do. Um, firstly, I, I empathise with everything I've heard, and I totally agree, and I think this bill is, is very important. And if I may, I'll tell you a story about a recent discovery which has taken us a long time, far too long, to actually get into the clinic. Uh, as an exemplar of what the bill may, may have actually meant in terms of speeding this process up. Um, in 2002, myself and my wife, Lynn, who's sat over there, um, came up with an idea that a particular type of antiviral drug, which is normally used to treat HIV, may actually work against papillomavirus. That's when we had the idea in 2002. We published our first paper on this. Uh, pap I should explain, papillomavirus is the virus that causes cervical cancer. And cervical cancer is very common if you look at the world today. One, in, one woman dies from cervical cancer roughly every two minutes in the world today. We published our first paper on this in 2006. Um, and the indications look good. And it's taken eight years from that first paper to get it into the clinic. Now you're thinking, this drug was already licensed for use in people by oral administration. We wanted to apply it directly to the cervix. So all we were proposing was a simple change of the route of administration, and it took eight years. We, we could only afford to do a phase one trial, but the results have been above, way above our expect, expect, expectations. And I believe the clinicians now tell me, I, I should say I'm, I'm a scientist, not a clinician. My clinician colleagues tell me this is what's called a phase one, two, because the efficacy results are so remarkable. And it just, it just grieves me that it's taken so long, eight years from the time of the initial publication, to actually get it into people. So this is a new use for an old drug, and I think there is a massive amount of, ex of, 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 of medical innovation that could exploit this particular track. And there are many examples like this that could be uh, possibly exploited, uh, much, much better than they are being. And so I wholeheartedly support this bill. Thank you. Um, we've got kind of five minutes left or so, and I wondered if we could open it out to anybody in the audience that either wanted to, to make a comment or um, to ask a question. McGuart Caring Cancer Trust. Um, innovative treatment requires innovative research. Will this bill speed up the implementation of research? Well, the bill isn't isn't aimed at research. It's aimed at um, clinical practice with patients in hospitals. You raise a very important point, though, in terms of research, which is that for this bill to be effective, one of the things which David and his colleagues in the Department of Health are going to have to do is to make sure that the information that is generated by these innovations is spread around the medical profession and around the medical community so that people really do learn as a result. Otherwise, it's pointless. So, I think David understands that. Um, and there's a question at the back. My name is Sarah Clark. Um, my mother has pancreatic cancer, which is another very hard to treat cancer. It's been a very emotional hearing some of the experiences here. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm quite a robust professional person, and I have fought hard to find every option possibly feasible to help my mother because prognosis for people like her is that you're going to have about a 4% chance of being alive in five years. Um, there are many people out there who are not willing or able to have those kind of fights. So as long as the mechanisms go with the bill to make sure that people do bring those treatments and that knowledge, gain that knowledge, take responsibility to gain that knowledge, the kind of centralised data store that was talked about. Um, I, I've supported it from the start. I'll continue to support it vehemently, and it can't come soon enough. It really can't come soon enough. Um, we are lucky um, to have David um, Hackett here from the Department of Health. I just wondered, David, if you had any, any comments at all that you'd like to make about this bill. 
Um, yeah, if I just pick up the, the point about research, um, it's come up quite a lot in our pre-consultation phase. Um, and of course, um, the, the, there are two arguments really on, on that. Um, the, the, the first point um, I think Lord Saatchi made is, is quite right. We, the intention of the draft bill is very much to, uh, where innovation has been successful, to share that knowledge out and into the medical community. Um, however, there is a, a sort of counter argument that by, um, in effect, putting this in the draft bill as being mandatory, that you, you may create more barriers and, 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 and more bureaucracy. So we haven't, we haven't included it as mandatory, we've just left it as a hope and intention. Um, but I, th I think that the honest position is we, we haven't made up our mind and it, it's a topic that very much, um, the, one of the reasons why we're having the consultation, we very much welcome comments from, particularly from, from clinicians on whether that strikes the right balance, whether we're going to achieve that. Um, or whether we need to, 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 to modify it slightly so it's, it's exactly what we're, we're looking for in terms of, of comments and I'd welcome anything that comes out of the consultation on that, on that point. Thank you. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately, but um, I, hope you, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, Google Hangout here at the House of Lords. Um, and please do respond to the consultation um, on this bill. Um, you can check out our website, which is Saatchi Bill dot tumblr dot com that's sarchibill dot tumblr dot com thank you all very much